Number seven, reformations on the continent. And I guess I should be specific and say the continent of Europe, since we're going over to the continent of Asia in, in uh, the second half today. But I wanted to just briefly cover three things with you tonight. One is to look at some successful reformations, picking up where I left Luther. You remember we watched that video clip, and he was very bold at the Diet of Worms, and he stood fast, and he was able to um, not, not recant, but to hold fast to what his beliefs were. I want to pick up from there and tell the story going forward in Germany, touch on just briefly Scandinavia and the Netherlands, places where the Reformation from Catholicism to Protestantism was successful, before going to talk going on to talk about, about France, and that's uh, point number two for tonight. It was a failed reformation uh, where the people tried to bring these beliefs, this new form of Christianity, into France and were horribly uh, uh, unsuccessful in the long run. And then uh, finally talk about the Thirty Years' War, which lasted from 1618 to 1648. So that's, that's my goal with you tonight. This is big picture stuff. We're talking about whole countries, groups of countries. Uh, the Thirty Years' War was basically a world war before they called it a world war um, that involved many different countries throughout all of Europe, and it was bloody and nasty, and it left a lot of people with a, sad, a sour taste in their mouths. But before I get into that, I wanted to just mention this course by Brad S. Gregory called The History of Christianity in the Reformation Era. It's a, an audio course. I think they might have a video version as well by the great courses, and I, I found it to be very helpful in my own preparations in what I, I, I'm going to share with you. He does uh, dozens of lectures on just the, the 16th century, so we won't, we won't, do, we won't follow all of his <laughs> lectures, or else we would never get out of this period, but uh, I just wanted to bring that to your attention in case you're interested in delving deeper. This man here is Philip Melanchthon. He lived from 1497 to 1560. He was a professor at Wittenberg, a professor of Greek. He started at the age of 21. Does anybody remember who else was at Wittenberg? Martin Luther, very good. He was a professor of Bible at Wittenberg. And so Philip Melanchthon was, his, in many ways, his partner, a, a real prime founder of the Lutheran movement in Germany. He was the first systematic theologian of the Protestant Reformation, and he came up with a way of looking at the Bible, dividing it into two main groups. One is law, and the other is gospel. And by law, he meant any requirement, whether Old Testament or New Testament, he would call law. Any requirement of something you have to do is law for him. And anything that talks about justification by faith is gospel for him. And uh, so that's uh, one of his contributions. In um, 1530, he was the architect of the Augsburg Confession. In just a minute, we'll uh, talk about that a little bit. But that was a confession or a statement of beliefs. I've included it in your notes at the, at the end of this part. It's a list of, I believe it's uh, 28 articles that talk about a whole bunch of subjects, God, original sin, the Son of God, justification by faith, the office of preaching, the church, baptism, the Lord's Supper, repentance, civil affairs, and many other things. And so you've got that to refer to if you're interested in knowing more in particular, in detail, what the Lutheran church really, how they differed from the Catholic church and what major doctrinal um, emphasis emphases they had. So anyhow, that's the work of Philip Melanchthon. And if you remember in 1521 at the Diet of Worms, Luther was declared an outlaw by Charles V, the emperor. And the understanding was that Luther would go home and be quietly arrested and then quietly punished away from all, this, uh, all, all the people that were supporting him in that, in that um, council. And in, instead of getting all the way home, what happened to Luther? Well, he was kidnapped, but kidnapped by his own protector, Frederick of Saxony, and whisked away to the, the Wartburg Castle, where he stayed for a year and translated the Bible from Greek, 
the New Testament from Greek into German. And by then, things had died down considerably because the emperor, Charles V, got embroiled with a war with the Turks and with France and didn't have time to focus on the Luther problem or the movement called Lutheranism that was springing up all over the place. And so in 1526, there was the Diet of Speyer, which suspended the Edict of Worms, but then in 1529, they reenacted the re Edict of Worms. Again, the Edict of Worms is that Luther is an outlaw and that those who believe like him are wrong and also considered heretics and are not legally allowed to practice their faith in, uh, in Germany, or they would say the Holy Roman Empire, but it's basically what we would mo in modern times call Germany. And then in 1530, there comes to be this great moment where Charles V wants to unite Christianity and deal with the, pro pro uh, we call them Protestants, he might have called them the protesters. These people that are protesting that this is wrong with the Catholic uh, practice of this and that and so on. And so Charles V wants to deal with them at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. This is a famous painting of that uh, moment where Luther is at Worms defending himself. And here is Charles V who is looking to unite Christianity, deal with these Protestants. He's finally got the Turks kind of situated long enough for him to come back into Germany and deal with this. And what ends up happening is Luther is not allowed to attend because he's still considered an outlaw. And if he leaves his province, he's going to be arrested and possibly even burned at the stake. So he has to stay home. But Philip Melanchthon goes, who is his right-hand man, and he presents what he had written and what I have included in your notes, the Augsburg Confession of 1530. He presents it there. And this is a, a drawing of the Diet of Augsburg. Philip Melanchthon was more of a, a, a politician in, in a sense that he softened a lot, of, a, a lot of what the Lutherans were teaching. He tried to make it seem a little more palatable to the Catholic mindset. Was trying as hard as he could to make this, make this thing work with the emperor. And so... He softened some of their positions, and he produced this document. The whole document was read out to Charles V in German, and it took two hours for him to hear it. After he heard it, Johann Eck, who had debated Luther before and was a Catholic defender, came and tore it to pieces metaphorically by writing a confutation, a refutation against the Augsburg Confession, and presented that to Charles the fifth. Charles V basically doesn't budge one bit from his Catholic identity, his Catholic league. He had been crowned, if you recall, he'd been crowned by the Pope himself, and he was looking to unite Spain and Germany and lands in the East as well, all together uh, under the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburg uh, lands and so on. And so he was already politically aligned with Catholicism, and this, this whole Diet of Augsburg had nothing to do with really him hearing things out so much as him dealing with the problem that needed to be dealt with. So Johann Eck presents this refutation, and the Lutherans, like Philip Melanchthon, are, are furiously writing down notes as this man is, is proceeding and going on, and they're not allowed a copy of it uh, until they agree with it. And so they come up with a response, and Melanchthon writes an apology, and by an apology it means a defense, uh, responding to Johann Eck's points, and Charles V won't even listen to it at all. It says everyone needs to sign this other document, and everyone leaves pretty unsatisfied. At this point, the German princes go back to their territories, and they start preparing for war, because you can't just say no to Charles V. He's got troops, he's got money. He's, he's the emperor. <laughs> so they start preparing for war. And in 1531, they join together. A number of these Lutheran princes join together in what's called the Schmalkaldic League of 1531. And, they, uh, and Luther is, is a little uncertain about this because Luther had always said, remember when the Peasants' War happened, he said, look, the, the, we, we should side with the government. 
The government has the right to rule, Romans 13. They are the ministers of God. Therefore, we should obey them. And now the government is saying, well, you have to practice Catholicism. That's what Charles V had just decreed. And so Luther's like, well, you know, if it's a just war, then we can fight against the government. And so he, he, he does ch kind of change his, his view a little bit there and give some theological backing to this confederation called the Schmalkaldic League. In 1532, the emperor called a truce at Nuremberg that lasted a decade because, once again, he's got to go out east and fight with the Turks, the Ottoman, the Ottoman Turks. During this time, Protestantism thrives and it spreads this 10-year little window from 1532 to 1542, and it goes to... Uh, Eastern and Northern Germany become almost all Protestant, and it also spreads to Scandinavia at this time, which is uh, something we'll come back to in, in a few minutes. In uh, 1546, finally, war breaks up, breaks out between Charles V and the Schmalkaldic League. It's called the Schmalkaldic Wars, and Charles finally free to deal with religious matters, and he's at peace with France, and the Pope sends money to support Charles to fight against the Protestants in Germany. And Charles easily wins in 1547. And Luther dies actually just before this war breaks out. And so Luther had just died. And the Protestant League of uh, Princes is smashed. And what ends up happening is the uh, emperor imposes a number of ca Catholic practices on these Protestants. Now, a lot of these Protestants, they don't want to do it. Some of them are going to go along with it a little bit. Philip Melanchthon says, look, it's just, it's just the outer stuff. We, it doesn't matter. We know what's true in our hearts. Others are less, are less willing to yield, and they're saying, I'm not going to w worship in a mass. I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, Catholicism, again, we've just been freed from this. And so it's just a matter of time until another war breaks out. In uh, 1552, we have the second Schmalkaldic War. And so that one ends with the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. The Peace of Augsburg is a big deal because of a few things. One is, it's, it's Charles V signing it and saying to the German princes, you can choose what religion, and there are only two legal options, Catholicism or Lutheranism. You can choose which to practice in your province. And they come up with this Latin phrase, quius regian, eius religio. Whose region, his religion. So if your region, if, 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 your, if your religion is Lutheran, then your province is going to be Lutheran as well. And each prince can determine that for, him, for his, himself, according to the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. So this, this all happens, and yet tensions continue to rise. We'll come back to that when we get into the Thirty Years' War. Now we move to Scandinavia, which is Norway and Sweden, and we also would include Denmark in this. And just, I want to say a few things about this. this so, so we would classify the Reformation in Germany as successful in the sense that the territories that became Lutheran were able to stay Lutheran and eventually work out a deal with the overarching governmental leaders to have some uh, freedom there. Um, and then in Scandinavia, by the uh, 16th century, during that that whole period of the 1500s, the monarchs there converted to the, the Lutheran faith. And what had happened is the Pope had interfered in the affairs of Sweden in 1523. And so Gustav Vasa, who lived from 1496 to 1560, the king of Sweden, he split with Rome because he didn't like the Pope interfering in his political matters. And in 1527, this man initiated the National Church now, the way a national church works is the king takes possession of all the church property, and all of the clergy become subject to the king's law, to the civil law of the land, rather than the uh, Roman uh, Catholic law. They, it used to be a bishop would, could not be tried in a civil court. He would be tried in a religious court. Now, since it's a national church in Sweden, people are going to be tried under the regular court. 
And he declared all churches to preach the pure word of God, kind of a Lutheran catchphrase. A, a Catholic wouldn't speak that way. And so Scandinavia throughout the 16th century, and there's, there's much more to the story. I'm just kind of just briefly touching on this, uh, becomes Lutheran. The Netherlands, as we saw before, was a place where the Anabaptists went and where they had some refuge for some time and that a lot of Protestant refugees went to. The Spanish government, there, there was a lot of, uh, in, in the Netherlands, there was a lot of iconoclasm. I don't know if I've mentioned that term before, but icona, iconoclasm, is that how you spell that? What is it? Oh, thank you. Iconoclasm is breaking icons, okay? And so what we're talking about here is the destruction of statues, Catholic statues, ransacking churches, knocking over the statues, tearing down the paintings, smashing the stained glass, because these things are considered by the Protestants as idolatry. And so you have this real, uh, almost like a Josiah-ish tendency to clean house. And this happens throughout the Netherlands. It happens from time to time in Germany as well. I just haven't mentioned it, where Protestants get really excited and, and the people, the, the common people, get this, you know, at the instigation of the preachers get really rallied up and they just take over a church and smash it all up. And that's a iconoclasm. And so that was happening a lot in, in the Netherlands. Um, and another thing that happened was the Spanish government harshly persecuted Protestants in the Netherlands. And so once again, we have a foreign power intervening. And then the backlash is a reaction against Catholicism because Spain, Spain is allied with the Catholics. And so in 1560s, we get the Dutch Reformed Church. The Dutch Reformed Church, which is the dominating religious institution, or becomes, comes to be the dominating religious institution even to this day in the Netherlands. Reformed, you remember, is a catchphrase or a way of referring to the teachings of who? John Calvin. So Reformed is another way to say a Calvinist belief system. And so we, um, that, that ends up happening, which really leads us to France and Francis I. This man was initially tolerant, and he was a humanist, so he, he liked some of the things he was hearing coming out of Luther and the movement that was starting there. In, uh, in France, the Protestants there are called Huguenot, spelled Huguenots, but pronounced Huguenot. And so if you were a follower of John Calvin especially or a follower of Luther and you lived in France, you would not be called Lutheran or Reformed. You'd be called one of those Huguenots. And so Francis I was dealing with these Huguenots, multiplying in his area until the year 1534. In 1534, what we get is the affair of the placards. This is a word. It's funny. I only come across this word on air, airplanes. You ever, you ever notice that in their spiel? They always say, observe all posted placards. Why don't they just say signs? I mean, seriously. <laughs> but anyhow, in 1534, what ended up happening is the Huguenot designed all these signs, these placards, that had Protestant slogans on them and Protestant teachings on them. And they organized it not just in Paris, but throughout uh, France. And they were denouncing the mass. And they were posted everywhere in the middle of the night including in the royal apartments. And so when everyone woke up in the morning, there were these signs everywhere proclaiming this, that Catholicism was bad and the Mass was an abomination and maybe something like the Pope was an Antichrist, very inflammatory kinds of things to say in a 90-something percent Catholic country like France. And the fact that they were in the royal apartments really freaked out the king because it said to him, these people can get close to me. These people are a threat. They're subverting the society. They're not being respectful. And what ends up happening is persecution. Several thousand Protestants fled out of France at this time in 1534, including John Calvin, 
who flees and ends up eventually in Geneva. Now, Protestantism continues to grow in France from the 1540s and the 1550s, and you have these undercover presses in Paris, Lyon, and also in Geneva that are pumping out all of this literature attacking traditional Catholic teachings and teaching the, um, the Protestant message. John Calvin, as we've already seen, comes to great power in Geneva, and in Geneva he establishes an institute to train ministers. And he successfully trains 88 ministers from 1555 to 1562 and sends them out to preach in France. Now, you have to understand, Geneva is in Switzerland, but it's right next to France, and it's a French-speaking city. And so John Calvin is a Frenchman who's kind of a, an exile out of France, who's, who's training up refugees as they come to him and sending them back into France as these subversive, subversive missionaries. And so in 1555, we get the first Calvinist church in France, in 1555, founded in Paris. By 1562, just a few years later, there are between seven and 800 churches in France. This thing explodes, and John Calvin is at the center of all of it, training up missionaries, writing literature, getting it all into France, somebody who's writing in the French language, very easy to do that. By, by the 1560s, we have two million Huguenots, and persecution begins to increase under Henry II. In the 1550s, furthermore, the Huguenots in France get to become more and more of a uh, political force than just a religious force. And what we get are the French Wars of Religion. This lasts from 1562. Look at these dates, 1562 to 1698. That is a long time for a country to have civil wars over whether to be a Huguenot or a Catholic. That's what they're fighting about. Now, to say that this is exclusively religious is to be completely naive to the way politics worked 500 years ago. A lot of this relates to powerful French families that are vying for ultimate sovereignty because France is a place where they want to have one king, one law, one religion. And that's kind of their slogan. And so these powerful French families, some are Huguenots, some are Catholic, and they're fighting with each other to try to gain some supremacy. So a lot of it is motivated by political reasons, but they're called the French Wars of Religion. I've got a quote for you. Let me uh, pull it up. The parish pulpits of Paris, that's a lot of P's there, huh? Taught hatred of heretics and suspicion of those, including the magistry, magistracy and monarchy, who allowed their continuing existence. Catholic preachers goaded people into a frenzy of fear and hatred of the religious and moral depravity of the deformed that would undermine royal efforts for toleration and produce deadly fruit. So what we have here are the preachers causing uh, trouble and fomenting rebellion and hatred towards these up-and-coming Calvinists in France and calling them, instead of reformed, they're calling them deformed, making fun of their name. For over the next 30 years, Huguenot and Catholics murdered and assassinated each other with increasing barbarity. It's a quote from the Carter Lindbergh textbook. This all leads to the moment in 1572 that we call St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. It happens in 1572. There was a marriage between Margaret of Valois and Henry of Navarre, two very significant, high-level people in France that are going to get married, one a Catholic, one a Huguenot. They're going to get married in Paris, and so all of the prominent people of France come to this wedding in Paris. Most of the Huguenot leadership is there in Paris to attend this wedding. And they have to leave their armies outside the city in the suburbs. So they leave their armies out there, their troops are out there, but they themselves are within the walls of Paris. Remember, this, this is back when they had walled cities and the walls actually meant something. 
before they had flying machines that could just bomb over the walls. <laughs> and so on August 24th, after the wedding, King Charles IX, who uh, reigned from or lived from 1550 to 1574, he had the gates of Paris locked. And what had happened is somebody had attempted to assassinate the pr uh, premier Huguenot leader, shot him with a gun from an ad ad adjacent building, and it didn't kill him, it just wounded him. And, and so there was a great fear that as soon as the Huguenot found out that their, one of their greatest leaders had an assassination attempt on him, that the Huguenots were going to respond violently. And so Charles IX's bright idea was to preempt the whole situation and send out a list of leading Huguenots uh, to his militia, lock the gates of the city so nobody could come in or out, and assassinate all the leaders of the Huguenots at night, early in the morning actually, while they're in their beds asleep. And so he, he gives this list of the heretics for a methodical massacre in their beds. People wake up, and they find out what happened. And remember, the, the preachers had been getting the people all riled up against these Huguenots, especially in Paris. And they, there's this impression that the king has finally decisively act, acted. Let's now finish the job. And there's a widespread massacre when thousands of these uh, Calvinists are murdered by the Catholics in Paris on this day of St. Bartholomew in 1572. Another quote I have regarding this, if I can find it, there we go. This is from somebody who was there. They say, the streets were covered with dead bodies, the rivers stained, the doors and gates of the palace bespattered with blood. Wagon loads of corpses, men, women, girls, even infants, were thrown into the Seine, while streams of blood ran in many quarters of the city. One little girl was bathed in the blood of her butchered father and mother and threatened with the same fate if she ever became a Huguenot. Just absolute barbarity going on in the city. It's hard to even fathom, isn't it? They estimate it's very difficult to get numbers on these things. One source I had said 2,000. Another source I had said 6,000. So between 2,000 and 6,000 people, human beings, are, are harshly butchered and mutilated and murdered on this day by the Catholics in Paris. However, it didn't end there because other cities started to join in on the mayhem and this idea spread to other provinces and so by the time it's all said and done in the lesser cities a total of 20,000 uh, had died in France from this um, the after effects of this massacre. Henry the fourth who lived from 1553 to 1610 himself a Huguenot became king and issued official toleration for Protestants. There was a lot that happened between what I just described to you in 1572 and in 1598 when Henry IV issues the Edict of Nantes. Catholicism remained the state religion, but Henry IV, who was himself a Huguenot, converts to Catholicism in order to become the king and famously quips, Paris is worth a mass. <coughs> Better overall to pretend to be Catholic than lose the opportunity to rule over all of France. And so he does, and he allows some toleration for the Protestants. By then, the Protestants are 15% of the population. And finally, in 1598, they have a little reprieve, a little moment where they're able to not be slaughtered or be in a state of fight, fighting. They were granted rights to worship, but not within five leagues of Paris. That's 17 miles of Paris. Draw a circle around it. If you're a Protestant, don't go in there. Huguenots are given civil rights in their own courts for legal protection. And then sometime later, Louis XIV issues the Edict of Fontainebleau, if I said that right. And uh, Louis XIV in 1685 revokes the Edict of Nantes of toleration, and he outlaws Protestantism, and he says, what am I tolerating these Protestants for? I'm a Catholic, one king, one law, one religion. I'm Catholic, my country is going to be Catholic. What do we have these Protestants, Huguenot, what do we have them for? 
And so he, re he uh, rescinds the uh, Edict of Nantes, and persecution flares up again. And at this point, we have a huge exodus of Protestants out of France. They're leaving. We're talking about skilled craftsmen, intellectuals. There's a brain drain as people leave. The intelligentsia leaves France and goes to other places because they're going to get persecuted. Silk workers, gla glass workers, silversmiths, watchmakers, cabinet makers. These people end up going to other nearby countries. It's not until 1787 when Louis XVI signs the Edict of Versailles that we once again see tolerance for Huguenot, Lutherans, and even Jews. And they were able to openly form congregations. But this is 102 years after the, the prohibition first started. So this is, in France, you know, I'm summarizing these things. I'm just hitting the high points. You have uh, the, the, the affair of the placards in 1534. That's the beginning of the story. And then in 1787, you have religious toleration. And all those decades and centuries in between, you've got wars, you've got politicking, you've got a lot of literature being produced as people are arguing their different uh, positions on it which all leads us to now the Thirty Years' War and the Emperor Matthias. The, the Thirty Years' War started for religious reasons. It was fought along, it didn't really start for religious reasons. It was more political. But you see, they didn't really separate politics and religion, so it's really hard to, really, to talk about it in one way or the other because the two were fused together. And so what we have here is a war that's fought along religious lines, but it's mostly for political reasons. They're not fighting over a doctrine, in other words. They're fighting over land. And the Thirty Years' War begins when this emperor, at, this is sometime after Charles V, in 1617, Emperor Matthias uh, has no male heir, and so he decides his cousin, uh, a Jesuit-trained man named Ferdinand of Styria, is going to be elected the next emperor. And so I haven't talked about the Jesuits. We'll, we'll come to that later. But the Jesuits are the wing of the Catholic Church that are super committed to Catholicism and to making Catholicism great, getting rid of the abuses, trying to make it be what it truly should be in their thinking. And so, in other words, the next emperor after Matthias is going to be this super Catholic man named Ferdinand. And so people are really worried about that kind of uh, influence coming in. And so in 1618, we get the defenestration of Prague. This is uh, one of the funniest uh, named events in church history. The defenestration is from the Latin de in uh, fenestra, I think is the word for window. So it means you get thrown out a window it's to, to, if you get defenestrated. Um, you get thrown out a window. What had happened is four Catholic lords came to Prague and they were accusing the leaders in Bohemia of certain things and trying to take away their, uh, their lands and, and their religious, um, uh, you know, religiously they're Protestants in this area. And so what ends up happening, I'm not going to go into all the details, but these, these representatives of the emperor two of them at least, get thrown, thrown out of a third-story window. And they fall uh, 50 feet to 70 feet, and somehow they're not harmed. They live to tell about it. The official Catholic line on this is that angels protected them because they prayed to Mary. The Protestant line on this is they fell in a pile of manure, and it softened their landing. And so I'll leave it to you to figure that one out. In 1619, so that's that, that kind of silly opening in 1618 opens the door for a war between Bohemia, which is an eastern territory, and the, the emperor who's in charge of Spain and Germany and so, some other very significant lands like Italy and uh, uh, some of the low countries. And what ends up happening is Friedrich V becomes... Uh, the king, he, he's declared king in Bohemia, and they say, we don't want you anymore, Emperor Ferdinand. We don't like you. We're, we have our own king. And he, doesn't he look like a king? 
Fred, uh, Fred, Frederick V of the Palatinate is uh, known as the Winter King. He reigns for about a year, and he has very little military support, and he is not very successful against the emperor, but he gets the war started. What we have here is a number of countries. We have the Habsburg land in the, in the west is Spain. In the east is Austria. And then you have uh, France. You can see France is in the middle there on the map. France doesn't participate in the Thirty Years' War, at least not for a while. And they get into it eventually. But uh, for, for the first whole chunk of it, they're not interested in it. And you see Bohemia is off here to the, to the east. There's Bohemia. And uh, this is the area we know today as Germany. And so most of the war is actually fought in Germany and Bohemia. And <clears throat> it's fought with, on the Roman Catholic side, Spain, Austria, the Slovene lands, which is down here. And they also have the southern Netherlands, which today we call Belgium, and much of Germany, the southern part of Germany, and Italy is on the Roman Catholic side. On the Protestant side, you have Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and, and Bohemia are fighting on the Protestant side of it. It's, it's a long, complicated war involving many battles, many phases. I'm not going to get into all the details. I just want you to know that there was this thing called the Thirty Years' War. It lasted for 30 years. Look at you. And this Thirty Years' War was an excessively violent conflict. And regardless of if it was for political or religious reasons, people thought of it in the terms of, of religion. And it leaves a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths. This is in 1630. Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden raises this absurdly large army. After uh, the, the whole situation gets handled out east in Bohemia, the this, this Swede, from 1611 to 1632, he reigns. He enters the war in 1630 with well over 100,000 soldiers at his command. And I think, I think the number was, was something like 170,000 uh, soldiers at his command, maybe a little less than that. Um, and he is able to start gaining some victories against the emperor. And then we have Johann George of Saxony switches sides from the emperor to Gustavus's side. And by 1632, they start to push the emperor back. By 1635, everybody's ready to negotiate for peace. Now, this war started in 1618. We're only in 1635. It's called the Thirty Years' War. We're not done yet. Because you know who decides to jump in? France. France decides to jump in, but instead of jumping in on the Catholic side, they jump in, and they're totally Catholic. They jump in on the Protestant side of the war. What? Now, why, why would they want to do that? Well, so long as the Habsburg uh, dynasty is fighting in Germany, they're not fighting in France or trying to take over France. And so for political reasons, they don't like the idea that the, the, this uh, one family has power over their country to the west, which is Spain, and the country to the east, which is Germany. France is in between. France is like, well, we don't really want the Catholic side to win in this thing because that would be politically bad for us. So they join on the side of the Protestants, causing the war to drag on another 13 years. Now, France had not been participating in the war, so they had fresh troops, they've got money, and they can really prolong this thing. Cardinal Richelieu is the chief minister of Louis XIII, and he comes up with this uh, phrase, raison d'etat, reasons of the state. And that's the idea that the state's survival is an end in itself. And so he can be an anti-Protestant at home. He's a Catholic cardinal. And join a war on the Protestant side at the same time. And so the idea is you're, you're doing what's best in the interest of the state and, and this whole raison d'etat. The effects of the war. In many parts of Germany, as many as one-third of the population died. Just imagine that. One out of every three people in the room died. I mean, that is a staggering statistic. Much of the war was fought with mercenary armies that were paid. This is not like our arm, these are not like our armies today where there is some sort of discipline, there's a clear 
order of command and rank and hierarchy and even consequences when you rape and pillage. In the old days, it wasn't like that. And a lot of times, they weren't paid. It was you get what you, what you can when you conquer the city. You pillage and loot the city, and that's what you get paid. Uh, not always, but sometimes, a lot of times, that's what ended up happening. And so the places where the war was fought, especially in, in Germany, is completely devastated. Whole, there's, there's one city where 96% of the people died. Uh, but it, it, on average, like a third. And then in Brandenburg, which is just to the northeast, as many as half of the people died. One out of every two people died in that territory during the Thirty Years' War. Not only that, when you have hundreds of thousands of troops and supply people and other you know, people that would travel with the military going through your land, they all got to eat. And, and the, their weapons are made from wood. And so where are they going to get the wood for their weapons once they've shot their arrows and their spears? How are they going to make new ones? From your trees. And so they, they wipe out whole sections of trees and they, they wipe out whole farms of food. And so in the wake of this fighting, you, for 30 years is a long time. You don't, you don't get back out to plant the crops the next year. You're done, right? And so you have in the wake of this great famine and disease because you've got dead bodies everywhere. And so you have plagues that will pass through the land as well. Absolutely horrible world war. Some people at this time actually stop practicing religion altogether. They say, we're done with it. And this, this kind of leads in as a foundation stone for late, later atheist thinking about Christianity. Because these are all Christians killing Christians. You see what I'm saying? And so an atheist, 100 years later, says, well, what about the 30 years war? You know, you don't hear that today. But back when these things were starting to first form, that's what people would point to. So finally, in 1648, we get the Peace of Westphalia. And it ends the Thirty Years' War, and we have a lasting peace. Pope Innocent X called the treaty... Okay, so let me just say what the treaty was first. The treaty was everyone could basically have the Peace of Augsburg. The Peace of Augsburg, if you remember, was... I know I throw a lot of dates at you. I'm just going to remind you what it was. Back in 1555... The uh, uh, Catholics and the Protestants of Germany decided whosoever province it was could determine the religion, right? Catholic or Lutheran. And so now we're 100 years later, and it's 1648, almost a, a century later. And what do we have? We have this on a wide scale, not just in a few German areas. We have this throughout Europe, this understanding that whatever the prince of that area or the ruler of that area is, that's his religion. And we have a third option now. We've got Catholicism, we've got Lutheranism, and Calvinism, or Reformed, or Huguenot. Okay? So now we have three options for what religion you can be. Pope Innocent X calls the treaty null, void, invalid, iniquitous, unjust, damnable, reprobate, inane, empty of meaning, and effect for all times. Why do you think he said that? Because the whole world is making decisions about religion, and they're not asking his opinion. <laughs> the whole world just decided whatever the ruler is of that area determines whether they can be Catholic or Protestant. right? And the Pope's like, wait, what about me? I'm the one that decides what people in the Holy Roman Empire, which basically doesn't exist anymore, I'm the one that decides what all this, this uh, people do. And so no one cared what the Pope thought at the Treaty of Westphalia. And so the Pope no longer is the arbiter of international affairs. The Pope is no longer making big decisions on what countries are, are doing. States are now beginning to act in their own interests, not in the interests of the Pope or any other church. And so what we get is toleration for those who want to practice their faith in the principality of another faith during... So, so you, you can even... Let's, let's say you're living in a Catholic area and you want to be a Lutheran. You can still do that in private. Nobody's going to mess with you. If you, want to, if you want to go to a Lutheran church, though, you need to move to a Lutheran territory. And basically the way the world ends up in the middle of the 17th century... It more or less stays that way till today. 
And so if you go to these different countries, it's a Protestant area, or it's a Catholic area, or it's Reformed, or it's Lutheran, and so on. Uh, I mean, that's, you can't say that 100% because there are other movements that, that come through. But this starts to give the shape of the world that would look familiar to us today. So let's take a break, and we'll come back and look at some Asian Christianity.